Sorry, I keep, I keep forgetting to cut the volume down. You know, I love that it gives me the little beep, beep, beep to say that we're ready to record. <laughs> I keep forgetting to cut that one down. I did remember to cut my phone off and to cut my watch off, so they won't be, nothing will be dinging on me, but oh, my computer. It, technology, right? It's great, but it seems like there's always something that is another challenge. I hope you've been having as much fun going through the Gospel of John as I have. This has been a good study. It's been a long time, and we've covered a lot of ground. Of course, we've done a few other things along the way. But we're finally getting near the end of the sermon series on the Gospel of John. Today, we're going to be in chapter 20, and we've only got two more sermons and that's still assuming that God doesn't give me another one in between. You know that often happens that uh, as I'm studying and preparing, God shows me something else to, to be able to share with you, which is good. Uh, I'm grateful that, that God is speaking and helping me to respond. But assuming that we follow the plan I have at this point, they will, we will have two more messages out of the Gospel of John. And then it looks like we're going to be going into the book of Ruth. I've been praying about that for quite some time and uh, looking forward to that unless God changes it. But that's what I'm looking at right now, that our next series will be getting into the book of Ruth. So I've already been doing some study, trying to get ready for that. But as we have been going through the Gospel of John, you know, John, we've covered some amazing stories in this study. Do you have a favorite story from the Gospel of John? You know, and try to, try to just relate it, keep it confined only to John. Anybody got a favorite story from John that really just stands out to you that you, you like to, to, to talk about or learn about? Anybody got a favorite story from the Gospel of John? Of course, that's a difficult one because you're thinking, okay, I get all the books confused because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do a lot of the same things, right? Okay. Well, anyway, keep thinking about that. Think about what your favorite ones are. Some of my favorites uh, are like Nicodemus, where we, we, in John chapter 3, very early on in the book, meet Nicodemus, the Pharisee that went to Jesus secretly by night because he was afraid to let the other Jewish leaders know that he was talking to this radical guy that they were all very angry at and wanted to get rid of. But Nicodemus snuck in and had a conversation with him at nighttime, and Jesus told Nicodemus, you know what? The only way that you can really be in a relationship with God is that you have to be born again that you had to be completely changed from the inside out by the power of God. And so a tremendous story there. I love, love all of that and what Jesus taught. Of course, a famous John 3.16 comes out of that conversation. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So that came out of that conversation with Nicodemus. But then what about the, uh, the woman at the well that was from Samaria? She was Samaritan, and it was somewhere outside of the city of Samaria, so we don't know exactly where it was. But that amazing conversation that Jesus had with her that shouldn't have happened on a lot of different levels, male to female, Jew to Samaritan, but Jesus just got right down to her heart at the deepest levels. And even though he knew all the failures she had had in her life, he was able to touch her very deeply. So when you think about Nicodemus, he met Jesus, Jesus talked to him. His life was never the same after that. This woman, I suspect, was the same. We don't know exactly what happened with her in the end. But we do know she got so excited from that conversation that shouldn't have happened that she forgot to get water and went running back to town and said, hey, I found this guy that I think is probably the Messiah. You ought to come meet him. And I think probably her life was never the same either because of meeting Jesus that day out on a hot, dry, thirsty day where she forgot about the water she'd gone to get. Now, stop for just a minute and look around the sanctuary. Everybody just take a minute to look, okay? Yeah, this is, this is safe. I want you to look at the people around you to actually literally do that. Because as you look around, you see some people that you know, right? Everybody sees somebody that you know. 
All right. Some of you probably see some people you don't know very well. You know them by their face because they come to, to worship or whatever. But you probably don't know them very well. And I highly suspect some of you, as you look around or see people, you don't know. I mean, you, you, haven't, you don't know that you've seen them before. Maybe you have, but you're not sure even if you've seen them before. But think about it. We are here with a lot of people, well, semi-lot of people. I'll be glad when we have the place full again. But we are able to actually be here with each other. Now, let's just in our minds imagine what it would be like to go back in time to the first century. So we're, we're thinking about going back right now to a church service in the time after Jesus has been crucified and he's gone back to heaven. And as the book of Acts is developing that story, the church is just getting started and they're learning how to do things. So there weren't any church buildings yet at that point. They were trying to figure out, well, do we stay with the temple? Uh, let's do some in the home. So they, they were trying to figure things out. But they were meeting together. They were having worship. So go with me in your mind to just a minute. And let's imagine that we go to Jerusalem. And we go to somebody's home that is having a worship service. And there's Nicodemus. Just imagine, just like you looked around a minute ago and you see the people around you. Imagine there would have been some opportunities assuming everything worked out as we assumed that Nicodemus came to Christ and followed up with that. He would have been in some worship services. Wouldn't it have been cool to walk into a worship service and sit down next to Nicodemus and him to say, wow, let me tell you about that night that I talked to Jesus personally and he told me about my need to be born again. And I had no, no idea at first what he meant. But now it's just completely changed my life. Wouldn't that be cool to sit down with Nicodemus and talk? Or go to a church in Samaria. Because we, we understand that Philip later on went to Samaria and they were responding very well. Even though you know, the Samaritans and the Jews hated each other. But imagine if we could go back in time and go to a church service in Samaria and go in and sit down and there's the woman. We don't even know her name. But to be able to sit down next to her, first of all, learn her name, and then get her to tell us about, you know, that, tell me about that day that you went out to get water and you met Jesus. And he said, let me tell you about living water and about the God who is spirit. Wouldn't that be cool? And I'm just, I'm, I'm bringing out all of that to just remind us how real all of those things are. That, you know, it, it's so easy for us to look at these stories and to look at the teachings from the Bible and it just becomes something distant, you know, maybe something for somebody else or, you know, whatever even your concept of God is. Growing up in church, some of you will not have a very good concept of God, unfortunately. You might have heard a lot of, a lot of things about judgment and that's what you're stuck on with understanding who God is. Or you might think God is a very distant God and he's not very involved because I had a lot of bad things happen in my life and if God is a loving God, why is he not at work in my life? And it's easy to get these ideas and push God off to the side. But what we're going to look at today in John 20, as we're getting somewhat near the end of John's Story And John is beginning to wrap some things up here. He's giving us today actually the purpose for why, for why he wrote in the first place. And as we look at what John is writing here, the whole purpose is what you are hearing, I hope, from the testimonies about experiencing God. John's purpose is to lead people to know Jesus personally. To not have it be something distant, to not have it just be some intellectual knowledge, but to have it be life-changing relationship that isn't just for putting on a good front when you go to church on Sunday and you get to sit in the sanctuary and you look around and see all your friends, but that it is something that goes with you every single day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, as well as Sunday. So we're going to be looking at what John's got to say about his whole purpose for writing the book. He wanted people to come to know Jesus as the Messiah, 
and then to go deeper than that to have life in his name. So that's what we're going to take a look at this morning. Go with me to John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, and you, you can read it up on the screen if you like, or if you have your Bible, that's even a little bit better because sometimes you need to see some of the things around a passage, but you see it where it's in the context. John chapter 20, 30 and 31, here's what we read. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So you see, John is wrapping up his message and bringing it back around to say, this is why I have written all of these things. And one of the things he focused on here as he's wrapping up his message is that Jesus performed many miracles. Again, look in verse 30. He said, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. So John is telling us that many of the miracles Jesus did were not recorded. In fact, if you remember from the end of chapter 21, this is chapter 20 and John's beginning to wrap things up, but he's still got some things that happened before Jesus went back to heaven. It's all still after the resurrection. But if you remember how the book ends, John says, well, you know what? If we wrote down everything Jesus did, I suspect that there wouldn't be room in the world to hold all of those books. And he's being a little bit exaggerated with that. But the idea is very true, is that John has not recorded everything. He is focused on the things that he has seen, the others have seen. So what we, what we need to recognize is that the disciples were eyewitnesses to these things that have been recorded. So it's not just something that's been made up or just fun little stories to learn, but these are eyewitness accounts. And specifically, John is focusing in on, in on the fact that he recorded seven signs of Jesus, which probably in our context is a little bit easier to think of as miracles. But for signs, you might even want to substitute the word proof, that John gave seven proofs of Jesus being the Messiah. And that was his intent. He wanted to go back through and pull out just a few things, seven miracles that Jesus performed that helped prove that Jesus was the Messiah. And we've gone through all of those as we have been working our way through the Gospel of John. I wish we had more time today to go back through each one, but we obviously don't. And so we're going to do a quick review to go back to just make sure that we remember which of those miracles John focused on. Because again, remember, when you put together Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are 37 miracles that Jesus performed throughout all of that. John only focused on seven of them. And so let's take a look uh, just to do a quick review what the miracles were. And then after we do that quick review, we're going to just come together with some basic ideas of what do we learn, some very basic truths that we can pull out of those miracles that Jesus performed. So first of all, if you remember, Jesus' first miracle was turning the water to wine. He had taken some of his disciples. He probably didn't have them all yet at this point, very early in his ministry. But they were at Cana, which is a, a small town up in the north in Galilee. And at a wedding feast, they ran out of wine, which was just absolutely unacceptable for the host to run out of wine during the celebrations. And so Jesus had the, uh, the people, the servants, get some great big jugs and fill them with water. And the water went in, and when it served out, it was the best wine that anyone had ever tasted. And so that was the first miracle that Jesus performed that John recorded. Then the second one was that he healed the official son, if you get to chapter 4. Then in chapter 4, we see that Jesus is still up in Galilee. The official lived in Capernaum, there on the coastline of the Sea of Galilee, and his son was sick. And he heard Jesus was traveling in the area, so he went out to find Jesus. We don't know exactly where he found him for certain, but it wasn't Capernaum. And that's one of the interesting things in that Jesus healed the little boy without ever seeing him. Jesus didn't have to go back to Capernaum to heal that boy. 
And it was interesting that there's a note when the father arrived back the next day after traveling and seeing Jesus and getting back. He talked to the servants when he found out, yeah, your son's fine. He was healed yesterday. Oh, what, what time was he healed? It was the exact time that he had talked with Jesus and Jesus said he will be healed. So that was the second one in John chapter 4. Then the third one is that Jesus in Jerusalem healed the lame man. If you remember in chapter 5 that there was this pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem in the area. And they had this belief that when the waters were stirred up that the first person in would be healed of whatever ailment they had. Well, this guy was paralyzed. And so he was at a distinct disadvantage, even if it were true, uh, that if the waters did get stirred and whoever got in first would be healed, if you're paralyzed, how are you going to do that? And he said, well, I've never for 38 years had anybody to help me get in in time. And Jesus healed the man. Then we see the next one, the fourth miracle or sign that Jesus performed was feeding the 5,000 people in uh, well, 5,000 men in John chapter 6. And if you remember, that did not include the women and children. So easily 10,000, 15,000 people, possibly even more. But two, two little fish, two loaves of bread to feed thousands of people. Then we see the next one, the fifth miracle or sign that Jesus did that proved his ability, his identity as the Messiah was that he walked on the water also in chapter 6. And uh, on that night, a number of things were happening actually. A sudden storm blew up, a windstorm, so that the disciples were really struggling with that. It was nighttime, and all of a sudden, here comes Jesus walking on the water. And uh, of course, scared the daylights out of them, terrified. But then Peter said, well, if that's you, then let me walk to you. And of course, when Peter started to, then he fell in the water because he didn't continue to look at Jesus. But that was the fifth miracle or sign. Then number six was he back in Jerusalem again. He healed the blind man uh, in chapter nine. And that is the one time when Jesus, as he healed the man, also said, I am not only giving you light physically, but I am the light of the world, speaking to some spiritual things, his spiritual need. And then the ultimate example, the ultimate proof of Jesus' power to be the Messiah. What is the last miracle that John recorded that tells us about Jesus being the Messiah? That, do you remember the last miracle? Yeah, Lazarus. So in chapter 11, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And of course, that's where we have that great conversation between Jesus and Martha before he gets to the tomb to raise Lazarus. And of course, she says, you know, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And Jesus, although he doesn't say it, basically, well, yeah, but then God wouldn't get as much glory because she didn't know what Jesus was about to do. But Jesus told her, even before he raised Lazarus, Martha, do you believe, do you truly believe that I am the resurrection and the life? And that whoever believes in me, even though they die, they will live. Jesus had that amazing power. So anyway, let's, let's think about the miracles. There are some lessons that we can learn from the miracles. And so let's just, in a very general, broad sense, pull these together. First of all, as we look at the miracles, we can see that Jesus cared about individuals and their needs. Because it didn't matter who they were. You know, that woman that was a socially hated person as far as a Jew was concerned, and Jesus was a Jew. He was a good Jew. And according to their society, he should have hated that woman. But he struck up an amazing conversation with her but then he also healed the son of an official in Capernaum. Man, those, they were miles apart, kilometers apart in identity, in social standing. Jesus didn't care. It didn't matter to him who the individual was, but that they had a need and that he could meet it. Which leads us into the next thing, that Jesus had the ability to meet all human needs, whether it was physical or spiritual, emotional, any, any kind of need, Jesus was able to meet that need. You know, he healed the people, but like with that blind man in Jerusalem, he didn't simply give the man back his physical sight, but he told him, 
I'm the light of the world. I am the only true spiritual light, the truth that is in this world. I am the only way you will get to know the living God, which were his words at another part in the Gospel of John that John recorded. Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But Jesus lived it out that day. He healed the blind man. He met physical needs, but he also met spiritual needs. And I'm sure there was a lot of emotion going on, too, of you know, however long that man had been blind, and then all of a sudden he could see. How, you know, the guy had been lame, paralyzed for 38 years, and all of a sudden he could walk. A lot of amazing things. But also we see from these seven miracles that Jesus performed that Jesus had power over the natural world. I mean, to take water that the servants knew was only water that went into those jugs, but then when the wedding host served it out, it was the best wine anybody had ever tasted. That was managing things that were not possible in human nature, in, in our world. Then, of course, calming the storms that we had. John records only one. But Jesus, on at least two occasions, calmed storms on the Sea of Galilee. And he walked on the water. Now, I know some of you guys are amazing folks. Anybody here ever walked on water? No? Me neither. And honestly, I don't really expect to. Um, we, we don't have many records of that happening. So I assume there's not much need of that continuing to happen. But it did. Jesus, as a real, living, breathing human being, just like you and me, walked on water. That means there had to be something more to him than just being a good teacher, good prophet, a person, a human being. He had power over all of our natural world. But ultimately, the greatest thing is that Jesus had power over death and life itself. And John recorded Jesus raising Lazarus, but there are two other instances recorded of Jesus raising other people from the dead. Jairus' daughter and the widow, that the, the town of Nain, as they were having the actual funeral ceremony, Jesus walked up and disrupted the whole thing, brought the young fellow back to life. He had power over death and over life itself. So those are the miracles, the seven signs that John recorded but let's go a little bit deeper because John didn't simply record those for us to get information. John's purpose was to help people come to know Jesus and to know Jesus in a personal relationship. So go back to verse 31. Here's what John said after he'd said, you know, Jesus did all these miracles and a lot of them are not even recorded. But here's what we come to. He said, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So that's what John wants to do. He wants to make sure that we, first of all, understand that Jesus was the promised Messiah. And so when we go back to the Old Testament, we see there was just this hope built in the Jewish people that God is going to send the Messiah. He's going to be our Savior. He's going to make everything right somehow. And they had a high expectation of that happening. They just misunderstood it when Jesus showed up and did it in a different way. But John says, part of why I've recorded this and the others have recorded is to make sure that you realize you can put your trust in the fact Jesus was the Messiah. And I like the way John builds it because he's been doing it from the very beginning of his book. John began by equating Jesus with God the Equator, God the Creator. Equator, that's good. John began by making Jesus equal, the same as God the Creator. So go back with me to John chapter 1, the first five verses, and notice at the beginning of what John wrote, he was already laying the foundation for what he is wrapping up now in chapter 20. In the beginning was the Word. Now, before we go any farther, just to remind you, the Word is from a Greek idea of communicating truth of being able to, to come to understand what this thing or this person, this idea is all about. So in the Greek mind, it was expressing a truth, communicating. 
And I don't think there's any better way to communicate and express the truth of God than in Jesus Christ. And so when we look at it from that, in the beginning was the Word, the, the perfect expression of God become human. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Very simple, very straight to the point. The Word, Jesus, was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. In Him was life. And that life was the light of men. That light shines in the darkness, and yet the darkness did not overcome it. So John is laying the foundation for us to recognize Jesus wasn't just a prophet, wasn't just a good teacher. He wasn't, he wasn't a good political leader or military leader. That's not what he was intended to be. He was the Messiah, God himself become human so that... His light, the light of His truth, the light of His glory could shine into the darkness of the world. So that Jesus came literally to overcome the darkness of sin. And anywhere you see the sin, sin talked about in the Bible, it is getting into the idea that it is a darkness. It is the separation from God. It is hopelessness. And Jesus came to shine light into that kind of darkness as the Messiah. And we started out by talking about Nicodemus and the woman at the well. But see, stories like that, stories like Nicodemus and the Samaritan woman show Jesus was the Savior for all people. That's what I want to emphasize now. He was the Savior for all people, Jews and Gentiles. It did not matter to Jesus who they were, where they were from. As the Messiah... He was the Messiah for all nations, for all tribes, for all peoples. Any way you want to look at humanity, Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior that came for all people. does not matter who you are, where you come from, or even what you've done. Jesus is the Messiah for all people. And John was laying that absolute foundation going back to the very beginning. This is God himself, the creator. You don't exist in and of yourself. You exist because this God made you. And this same God that made you is now coming in the person of Jesus Christ because he doesn't want you to live this life or eternity separated from him. But the first step is to realize that the, the, these miracles, these signs, proved Jesus was the Messiah. We've got to come to an understanding of at least some basic facts, some intellectual knowledge. This is God himself among mankind. Jesus was the Messiah. But that's not enough for John because John wanted his readers to know Jesus personally, not to just know him intellectually and to come to a sense, yeah, well, I agree that he is the, the Jewish Messiah. It, it's gotten to go beyond that. John wanted us, all people, to know Jesus personally. Look again at the last part of verse 31. And notice what John is saying. After he said, you know, I've, I've written these things so that you can believe Jesus is the Messiah, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That's what John's bringing it down to. You need to have your life impacted by the power of God showing you and working in your life that Jesus is the Messiah. Because at that point to recognize that Jesus was the Messiah and to actually believe in his name for life, meant that it was more than just an extension of Judaism. This is not just Judaism continuing to grow and developing something new because Messiah has come. This is not a new religion. This is a personal relationship with God himself, the Messiah. John says it's got to be that because if you are only believing in him in your mind as the Jewish Messiah, you are still missing the point. It's got to come to something that hits your heart, that changes your life, because Jesus wants you to have life in his name, both now and in eternity. And so God has made himself known to draw people to himself. That's what this is all about. John and Matthew and Mark and Luke recorded the things they saw as eyewitnesses to help prove 
Jesus was the Messiah. They wrote those things down, not just so that we can know about Christianity in a distant, disconnected sense. They were written so that we can know the God behind that. Because God doesn't want to be behind it. He wants to be in front of it. He wants to be in our lives every single day of our life. No matter what we're doing, no matter where we are, it's not a matter of this is my spiritual life and this is my real life. God says, I want you to have real life every single day of your life. And the only way you're going to do that is when you are letting me walk with you and guide you. And that's what John is saying. He said, I have very carefully chosen these seven miracles out of many that Jesus did because these seven give us the information we need to see, to understand, to know this man was more than just a prophet, more than just a good teacher. He wasn't just a military leader or political leader. This was the Messiah promised from of old and by believing in him, your life can be changed. It will never be the same again. And that's why I liked bringing up Nicodemus and the woman at the well. Their lives were changed because of an encounter personally with Jesus himself. And though we don't have the opportunity to meet physically like we're sitting here and I had you look around in the sanctuary earlier at the people around you, we can't talk to Jesus and meet him that way right now. That time is gone. Now, it will return in the future, but right now, we don't have that opportunity, barring some unique miracle of God. But He wants to meet with us just as real as that in a spiritual sense, to be part of your life, to be part of my life, to give you a life you did not realize you could even have. Life in His name. He can change us in ways we would never even begin to believe possible when we allow Him to be the one in control. So how do we live that out? How do we apply what John is saying this morning that you know, these saints have been written to prove that Jesus is the Messiah and that by believing in them, believing in Him as Messiah, you will have life in His name how do we bring it together and put it into practice in our life? Well, I think here's what we can do. One, it obviously is, is a great message for evangelism. But you know, we, we spent our last five messages talking about evangelism. So let's go a little bit different direction than that one. Let me ask you, as you think about this very idea of a personal relationship, what are you doing to show God that you love him? I mean, what are you doing in your life? What's different in your life that for you proves your love of God? I mean, God's proven his love of you. That's what, G what John said, right? These seven signs are proof that God loves you. Just another way of saying it. It's proof that he, Jesus was the Messiah. And by believing in him, you can have life in his name. That is just another way of saying God loved you so much. He came, died in your place, rose again to give you eternal life because he wants to be involved in your life. He has shown you, literally, he loves you. So my question back to us, me included, what are you doing? What am I doing to show God that we love him? Well... Let me just remind you that a relationship with God doesn't only happen on Sunday morning. If that's what you're counting on to be right with God, you're going to fall way, way, way short. And you're going to miss it. Miss out on an opportunity for the most life-changing thing that can happen ever in your life. Because every area of life needs to be submitted to God. Not just when we can come to church and look around and see our church friends and put on our church face. Every day of life, we need to be submitted to Him. And He will do amazing things if we're willing to submit. But we looked at John 30, 20, 30, and 31. Let me encourage you to go back and write out by hand John 20, 31, verse 31. You might want to write both of them, but 31 is the one I really, really would like you to focus on and like me to focus on this week. But put it somewhere where you can see it throughout the day to be a reminder what the Bible is all about. 
The Bible's not just a collection of interesting stories. It's not just a textbook to teach Christianity. It is a book to point us toward the living God so that we can live life in his name. So put this verse where you can see it throughout the day. Look at it repeatedly throughout the day to be reminded. But these are written, the Bible is written, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I think if you do that throughout the day, you'll begin to see some attitudes in you changing as God begins doing his work. Let's pray. Father God, I... You know, as, as we come this morning and, and we are challenged with these truths that John has written as he's wrapping up his message to us, I'm, I'm just humbled by how much you have done to prove your love to us. Help us to dig deep in who we are, to truly examine our lives. Every one of us that hear this message, help us to examine our hearts to look deep inside and see where we really stand. Because we can put on a good front when we come to church and other people see us, but you know our hearts better than we know our hearts. You know what every attitude is, whether it's a good one or a bad one. Help us to learn to put down the defenses, to stop struggling against you, to let you be in control and that we will learn to let your spirit guide us so that we can live the life in your name that you've intended for us to live. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Our musicians are going to come on up and we're going to sing, I Love to Tell the Story. And as we do, I'm going to come down. And if you want to come uh, pray with me about what God is doing in your life and if I can help you with that, I'll be glad to, to pray with you for God to work, to set you free from the things that, that are holding you back from really serving him, really knowing him. Um, maybe today as you've been listening to the message, you're just not sure about even the relationship with God. Or maybe you know you don't have a relationship with God. That's what it all comes back down to. You heard that message in the, the testimonies about experiencing God. That's what John wrote for. That's the purpose of the Bible, to teach us about God in order that we can know him personally. He, he created you. He made you. He loves you. He wants to be involved in your life to give you purpose and meaning and direction. If you don't know him, please come talk to me during the song or catch me after the service. And let's, let's begin that conversation. Or, let me challenge you, we've spent five weeks, five sermons talking about being sent. God is sending us into the world to share the gospel message. If you want to come and have me pray with you about God using you in power to, to share his, his message, please come on down and let's do that too. But I'll be at the front if you want to come pray as we sing.